Welcome to the latest in the Travis Smith Brexit themed videos. I'm joined today by Thomas Schultz, who is a senior partner and head of the London office of leading German law firm Neuer. We together are going to explore the German approach to Brexit. Thomas, perhaps I can start by asking you about the approach of the recently formed German government to Brexit. We now have a reformed grand coalition, as it's called, mm. between Angela Merkel's party and the SPD. The SPD is traditionally pro-European, mm. and I wonder what your views are on the way the SPD will influence the German approach to Brexit. Well, thank you, Chris. I think you will see some influence, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when you read through the current coalition agreement. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of talk on, you know, uh, the social situation and the social union within the European Union. So I think there is some influence, but it's important to note that the government is a grand coalition, uh, but it was a grand coalition before, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think one should overestimate the influence of the SPD. Conceitedly, uh, it's the finance uh, minister is Olaf Scholz, who is an uh, SPD uh, party member, and I think you'll, you'll see some input from him, in particularly on a European transaction tax he has just been uh, commented on. Okay, and do you think that what's going on in other parts of Europe, uh, we've seen in the last few days populists forming a government in uh, Italy uh, with a Eurosceptic mm. tendency. The Visegrad group of countries are also mm. more Eurosceptic in tone. Do you think those uh, developments elsewhere are going to influence the German approach to, uh, to the Brexit negotiations? I would say they uh, let the, would let the German government think about a variety of things. Mm -hmm. I think on Italy it's probably first to get to know the government and understand what uh, this new government of these two parties is up to. Um, I think the Italian finance minister said that the country will of course remain in the euro, which I'm sure will be seen as a positive in Berlin. I think on Visegrad it's a little bit different because there the discussion on refugees is going on for a longer time with the German government. Um, but if you compare that with uh, Angela Merkel's latest uh, interviews she gave on the uh, institution of a European agency on refugees, I think she is trying to move the discussion beyond a pure discussion on uh, you know, distribution of refugees among the European Union uh, member states, which is, I think, one of the uh, topics which the Visegrad states have a very strong uh, negative opinion on. Okay, thank you. Um, it's sometimes said this side of uh, the channel that uh, Germany would like to see Britain punished for mm. leaving the EU to deter other countries doing mm. the same and finding if an agreement from the UK's perspective mm. is attractive, attractive to them mm. as well. What's your perspective on that? Mm. I hear this a lot, uh, particularly here in London, but mm. uh, in all honesty, I don't think there's any sentiment uh, as far as I can see and what I read uh, by the German government, uh, nor by um, certainly German and, uh, industry on punishing uh, anyone here. I think people uh, are, I think, regretting that this uh, referendum came about and you may have a different opinion on whether you like the result of the opinion or even like whether that question should have been asked in the first place. I think the German um, government's uh, attitude has been a consistent one of regret but it now moving on and actually trying to curtail damage and in particularly if you look at the German industry there's just a paper has just come out by one of the associations uh, directly directed at German Mittelstand and what they should do in order to prepare for what's going along. Um, and uh, there are also some of these chapters are on opportunities. So I, don't, I think people are like to see a practical approach on things um, and I don't think that uh, punishment in any sense or form is, is a category. Um, obviously the German government has a, uh, has a high interest Mm -hmm. that you know the European Union stays together and that are not other countries following suit. 
Um, but um, there was a referendum, and I think the German government certainly will respect that. Okay. I mean, contrary wise, it's also sometimes said that as Britain is such a big trading partner mm. for Germany, and so many German cars are sold yeah. here, for example, that actually yeah. the influence of German industry will mm. mean the German government adopts uh, a much more mm. enthusiastic approach to a good deal uh, mm. for Britain. Is, th is there any evidence that? Uh, that's the way the German government might approach I things. I don't think, um, I think the German government is speaking a lot with, you know, industry leaders mm. in what their approach is and I think understands that approach very clearly in this uh, orientation paper I just mentioned and there are many more. You can also see that uh, there is <coughs> a, there are all sorts of practice groups with associations and with the German government in order to, you know, bring uh, German um, uh, or the voice of German industry uh, close. I mean, I think Britain is the biggest export market of uh, Germany, I think, in the EU. Um, but I think a, a larger export market is actually um, is, is, uh, is rarely seen. So it is very clear uh, and you mentioned the automotive, obviously. I mean, uh, this is a very important, important market. Um, but obviously, this is a political decision to get a right deal. And there are many other concerns uh, a government uh, has to do. But I think they will, they, as Germany is an export nation, I think that is one of their, this is, I think, high on their priority list, let me put it this way, okay. of the government. I mean, does the German government, do you think, see Brexit as an opportunity for Germany in some respects? I mean, focusing on financial services, um, it's been said that uh, this might be an opportunity mm. to build up Frankfurt yeah. uh, as more of a financial services mm. powerhouse than it is at yeah. the moment by taking some of the business mm. from London. Uh, do you think that is going to influence the way Germany thinks about the settlement in terms of financial services in particular? Mm. I think that the German attitude certainly is something is, is, is in the direction of preserving as much as possible mm -hmm. the uh, you know financial services uh, sector. Um, I think obviously Brexit will make in certain shape or form financial transactions more expensive how much more expensive is something to be evaluated. Um, and obviously Germans view Frankfurt as an ideal place to do business. Um, some of the banks have, you know, at least built up some staff or some operation in Frankfurt to the extent they hadn't done so before. Um, and of course there's a big discussion whether Euro clearing, uh, you know, can any longer be uh, held here in, in that shape it has been held at the moment uh, or whether or not it should move to uh, let's call it the mainland Europe and obviously Frankfurt is being seen by some as an ideal uh, um, you know location but may I remind you on the situation with the European Banking Authority and you can certainly see that Germans may be good in lobbying in some areas, but that I don't think that was a really a, a big uh, a success for German lobbying. Um, and obviously on, the, on, on that side, Germany will do more, but I think could do even more for, for a sector, particularly for asset management, for example. Okay. Um, I, I attended a dinner recently at which a senior former mm -hmm. British EU diplomat spoke. And his perspective on what was going on at the moment was that apart from for Ireland, mm. Brexit was now relatively well, well down the list of important items for most other mm. EU 27 mm. governments. Mm -hmm. And that as a result, they were more inclined to delegate to the European Commission a large part of what was mm. going on. In other words, Brexit is not as important for other governments mm. as we in Britain thinks it is. Mm. Is that a view you would subscribe to? Mm, I, I, I have my doubts whether that's a true view with respect to Germany. Uh, I come back to the coalition agreement mm -hmm. and uh, although this of course being a lengthy political document, 
but the document lists some threats or challenges for the European Union. Uh, one, of course, is the refugee crisis. Uh, the second one is high unemployment in, in the youth uh, in, in Europe. And uh, the third one is Brexit. So the documents mentioned that. And it mentioned Brexit not extensively, but in some other areas. And also the discussions I have with uh, people with sometimes when I meet uh, politicians or um, people in industry, I think that has coming back to the, uh, to the trade aspect and to the um, importance of England uh, for, a, for German industry, I think it has a quite a high, uh, it's a, a high level of attention. It may not always show, and in the world we are living, uh, particularly after the G7 summit, it's just very tough to really concentrate on one point. There may be news maybe coming up and, uh, you know, make it difficult to, you know, really refocus on that. But I think that, uh, that will remain a very important point for the German government. I don't think that the German government, as I think it never does, this is a level-handed way uh, of, for Germans to do that. I, I don't think that they'll just say, well, it's just being handled by Brussels, because I don't think that's, that's their approach to do things. Okay, just looking ahead now, um, Angela Merkel was uh, weakened by the last mm. election. Um, it's said that this will be her last mm. term as Chancellor. Um, what do you think the timing is for the choice of her successor? Mm. Who are the likely candidates and mm. are they going to adopt a different approach to the Brexit negotiations mm. to her? Uh, it's probably one of the more you know, forward-looking questions. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a couple of candidates who are being portrayed as natural candidates, like the Health Secretary Spahn or Kram Karrenbauer, her secretary, uh, the party secretary at the moment. Um, I think uh, certainly we're going to see some movement, probably. It's my personal opinion in the second half of the term. And, um, uh, and uh, I don't think really that the, at least what I saw, that the attitude of the, the people who are being considered as potential successors uh, would be much different to Brexit as the present uh, government. And of course, uh, you know, things will have happened then, right? I mean, um, the end of March 19 will have happened then. And of course, you're ending a phase of continuing negotiations, uh, which may take uh, many more years than I think the British government is projecting at the moment. Um, and of course, a change in uh, after a, such a long time of, uh, you know, for a political leader like Angela Merkel, uh, also can, you know, be seen as as a imp impulse for much greater change uh, in the in the uh, political uh, coalition making, as you have seen that uh, in the past. Um, given the glacial pace at which. Mm negotiations mm. appear to have been taking place so <laughs> far and the fact that time is running yeah. out to sort out a lot of the detail mm. one can envisage a situation where the most sensible course is actually mm. to extend mm. the article 50 period w what view do you think germany would take mm. if that were the way events unfolded and yeah. that was proposed seriously mm. Um, I think the German government would would weigh very carefully the pros and cons of agreeing to that course of action. The inclination would be, of course, if we aren't done yet, let's just continue talking. Uh, so there is a natural inclination to agree to that approach, but obviously it's the uncertainty which is, of course, uh, something which not only business, but also, you know, the uh, political uh, class in Berlin is, is not happy with. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, I couldn't really say what they do, how, but how they would handle that. Uh, but they, they would weigh that um, very, very carefully. At the end of the day, I think they'll probably try to find, up, find a um, more practical solution, which would probably indicate consent to that um, 
uh, to, to such a proposal, but as you know, it's for 27, for 26 additional uh, mm -hmm. governments to agree. And um, what people, of course, sometimes overlook is that there is a lot of negotiations going on among the other countries as to the right course of action with respect to Brexit. Okay. Eventually, one assumes um, the UK and the rest of the EU will move to discussing the meat of a free trade agreement. Mm. We hear a lot about British red lines, mm. but does Germany have any red lines in relation to a free trade agreement? Well, I haven't really uh, read anything really concrete on that. Uh, what you see in Germany is that, again, um, ideally as easy a trade with the UK as possible, um, which would clearly ask for some sort of additional uh, stay in the customs union. Um, particularly on the on the financial services side, if you mind you how many companies, particularly on the high yields, are uh, uh, you know financed through London or actually New York for that matter. Um, I think a certain level of free movement of people is probably uh, important for the German government. Mm -hmm. um, not least because you know German companies have a lot of. Uh, facilities, branches, subsidiaries, production facilities in, in the United Kingdom and obviously people want to have a situation where they you know, can move people among these undertakings. Um, and if you think about that, some of these could probably be qualified as red lines, but I don't think that the German government has actually defined a very straight um, red lines because I think, like Angela Merkel said, I think at Davos to, uh, to Mrs. May, um, I think we need to understand uh, the proposal of our, of our English friends before we can come up with a sensible answer. Okay. And finally, um, uh, some of uh, the European lawyers I speak to uh, have expressed the view that Brexit may see some degree of retreat in mm -hmm. terms of the use of English law. Mm -hmm for financing and other transactions on the continent of Europe. Mm. Do you think Brexit is going to weaken the influence of uh, uh, the use of English law to govern not just finance contracts mm. but broader contracts? And do you see any evidence of that so far? Yeah, to be quite honest with you, I don't. Um, I think there could be, depending on whether you steer into a hard Brexit or not a hard Brexit, there can be some instances where you might use a continental law uh, and a jurisdiction. Um, but, I mean, English law is only part of the equation, right? There is the English language, there is the product of in London uh, and, uh, and in the Anglo-Saxon world, which I think is one of the driving forces uh, why English law uh, remains and has this prevalence. So I don't think, although of course as a German lawyer I'd like to see more German law to be used, but I don't think I'll, I'm going to see that effectively. Okay. Well, Thomas, thank you for a fascinating insight into the German view of uh, Brexit. Pleasure.